Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live Show number 365. And yes, your eyes do not deceive you. I have company. <laughs> Intelligent, thoughtful, insightful company. No more random babbling on my part. This is this is serious dialogue. With us is Miss Stephanie Smith, matriarch. Mm, I like the title, uh, but founder, nonetheless, all the same, Cogwheel Marketing. Hi, Steph. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. There will still be some rambling, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah. you know. it, it, But that's good rambling compared to, what is the hell is he talking about now? That kind of rambling. We're getting off of that. We're getting into the one lane tracking kind of stuff. For those unfamiliar with or have not been watching the show long enough in the history, Stephanie used to be a persistent per contributor to our show. And it is fun to have dragged her back. I think bribery and extortion are viable tools. Uh, <laughs> and yes, I'll release the pictures now that you're on the show. <laughs> no, it's good. to. It's good. It's um, I miss the uh, someday. I def, some Fridays, I definitely miss the old the old crew when we'd have a bunch of people with sometimes very um, differing opinions. And that's what made it spicy. Right. Oh, it, was very, it was very nice for you saying different opinions rather than totally whacked ones. <laughs> I know I lured everybody and I actually lured you into the idea of like, oh, we're going to talk about dynamic revenue management in relationship to currently coming into budget season. And Steph made it very clear. That's nice, but we'll probably go off the beaten path a little bit on some other discussions. So I actually, in preparation of this, have some questions because I put a new link in posting uh, the show up of where people can add comments or questions and send them over. So because uh, rather than them having to be on the show, which is a time zone issue. Uh, I said, well, let's see if we can get other people to have questions. I actually have a couple of queried questions, which I'm not, I'm going to drop at the appropriate moment. But given that you're our guest, are being plural like me, myself, and I, shut up, let him talk. Uh, <laughs> what would you like to start off with in our discussion, Steph? Man, there's so many things going on. Um, and if anybody's dropping questions in the chat in full transparency, I'm not a revenue manager, but I always have my two cents to share especially as we go into budget season and, you know, how, you know, just full commercial strategy approach in terms of breaking down the silos. Um, have you already done like HSMAI recap, Lauren? I, know I have done some, but I think it's always well to expand because, of course, it's just my direct perspective of what I witnessed. You were an active participant, which, by the way, ooh, I have an audio of your presentation, which I'm going to clean up. Well, it actually just um, came out from HSMI. Did they find it? Yay! Okay, good, so, good, 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 good. Thank good. you, Jason. If you're listening, I was like, I really want this, and I don't know how to get it. So, can you just publish mine first? <laughs> <laughs> you kicked it off very nicely. And for those that didn't make it to the conference, what did you do? So, um, if no, if nobody's ever been to HSMI's marketing strategy conference, I highly recommend it. It's probably like my favorite conference of the year, but it's also like a big reunion, right? We had a big mm -hmm. party. Uh, we hosted a party uh, with Hopper, which we had a good turnout with. But um, anyways, at HSMA, they always do these things called a lightning round. The lightning round, for a presenter who doesn't mind presenting, this was extremely stressful for me. Like, right, Lauren? Like, I can talk all day. I can, if I've got my own slides, give me, you know, I, I'll get up and talk to a wall, no yep. problem. But yep. this stress of the way the lightning round is, you've got 20 slides, exactly 20 slides, exactly 20 seconds per slide. You have no control over the delivery and timing. You have to just be on time, right? You have to. So I had to, I had to practice. I couldn't just speak off the hip like I always do yep. um, to the point where I gave myself a stomach ache um, that I was so stressed out about it. But it's not the point. Um, I uh, My presentation... Um, was a Titanic themed presentation about, you know, return on ad spend is probably not the best metric that we should be quoting to our owners. And we basically mistrained our owners to look for this, you know, last click attribution, you know, we spent this, we made X and we, it's a, something that's easy and tangible for mm -hmm. owners to digest. But at the same time, it doesn't really take it into consideration the entire customer journey. And if a hotel has something broken in their story, you know, like that's not, you know, that's not going to become apparent when we have that communication with owners. So um, the presentation is live. I think we can um, drop that. I think I have it available. I'll drop it in the chat here in a second. Um, 
So, uh, Lauren, what's your favorite? I mean, I feel like KPIs can be deceiving because when we talk about revenue management, even our revenue managers are like, well, what was our ROI? Okay. Um, well, but it's not really, that's not what it's. it's no, it, it actually, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I had to be restrained because I was, you know, just the audio and I didn't want to oversee the audio because I had it on the desk, you know, discreetly like, okay, I want to catch hers. Um, but by the same token, I felt like I was in a religious circumstance where I was like, yeah, preach, you tell them. Cause it, it really was. And if, again, if anybody is unfamiliar with the lightning rounds, it, it, the, the nuance of it is to be timed. So there's a quantified amount of content that you are allowed. And, you know, of course, sequentially the slides and so forth, but the real skill, and you pulled it off masterfully, was you lost track of the constraints of the presentation. Like, oh, how well is she doing? Is she hitting those cues? Is she talking about what the screen? You went past it to where the presentation was the value. So compliment to you for that, because it turned out that you stopped thinking about that slide's going to turn real quick. Or, you know, it is, she isn't talking about what's up there. None of that ever happened. It was just like, like as if you were in control of the presentation at a consistent, uh, you know, canter and pace. That said, totally in with you with Ross. As a matter of fact, my biggest discussions with all clients now is stop. Don't, with the ROAS discussion and ROI, I put two in the same category as a single slice of time. That was a huge rabbit hole, Lauren, that I went back and forth about, do I, you know, like, am I going to lose everybody if I get into the intricacies of, I define, everyone says ROI, but in reality, most people are quoting ROAS, right? Yeah. you know, like what does return on investment can mean a lot of different things. It can mean a whole bunch of different things, right? right? So, but I was like, this might be a little bit too much for six minutes and 40 seconds, but yeah. totally a hundred percent on, on yeah, like, yeah. I feel like people use it interchangeably, but it's not really, it's not really the same thing. It's not really the same thing. And it can always be defined, especially ROI, distinctly different, as you said, based on the conditions of what you're defining as return on investment. That being said, they, I think most people tend to simplify it into a ROAS interpretation, like, okay, spend versus actual acquisition. I have spent a lot of time with my clients now to start talking about percentage contribution, top line contribution, because it, 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 it's a common KPI. Revenue managers use total gross revenues. Uh, operations look at revenue man, uh, total gross revenue relationship to their flow through costs. Uh, it's more of a common marker, KPI marker, to say how much is this contributing to top line revenue? And creating that percentage metric, because to your point, I uh, plenty of times we have amazing ROAS numbers, like 30 to one, oh, we're so good. But we can, we drop $5,000 on what they need $150,000 for. It's like, yeah, okay, that wasn't everything I needed. So now it's more like, well, what do you see as percentage contribution? And then that really frees up, strangely enough, it frees up marketers to look at what is the spend necessary based on the metrics you have, conversion values, total volume of voice, to figure out how much money can you really make from that channel. Yeah. So yes, I, long answer to, I completely freaking agree with what you said. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think it's easy, right? Especially, you know, everyone's in a different place in their digital marketing journey. So some people, I still feel like a lot of owners were still having that very, you know, that, um, that education piece that goes into it. Right. So you're starting at here, but even different revenue managers, they're different places in their rev in their journey in terms of learning digital marketing. So how do we, you know, how do we continue to evolve that? And even like entry level digital marketers, I mean, 10 years ago, I would quote ROAS too, because it was easy. It was tangible. It was right in front of your face. Right. But as we like continue to, uh, you know, evolve and understand the entire and all the dynamics to go in and out, it's just not the, uh, we have to, and I think the ownership's on digital marketing. If we actually want revenue management to owners and all that to continue to give us a seat at the table. That's my other big thing is, a lot of management companies, marketing doesn't have a true seat at the table in the commercial strategy. It's still mm-hmm. like marketing answers into a revenue manager or answers into a salesperson. Like they don't, they're not on the, you know, they're not seen as equals basically. Yeah. They're not in the decision process. They're in the reporting and implementation processes. They supply the information and then they reciprocate with they, they, they reciprocate to the decisions as to the modality, the tip of the spear mentality. Like, okay, now that you told us what we're supposed to do, we got to go fetch it with what metrics we have. But I think also the history of Ross was a little bit on the contained of, it was one metric that marketing could put most of the fences around. They weren't relying upon outside data sources and or other conditions of departments doing stuff. It was a matter of spend versus return. And even that return, even if there was a lack of inventory, could be calculated on what it should have done based on the volume of traffic and implied revenue, which we unfortunately did for many, many years before we had real tracking. So, Yeah, but 
<clears throat> I mean, everything we do in marketing is still somewhat dependent on revenue management. You can run a kick-ass campaign um, and your revenue, you know, depending on how your rate strategy is or if you're out of parity, you know, it can all, it really doesn't matter, right? So. Yeah. Kind of throwing accolades in the chat, just like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, quite Now, this is actually, so for me, one thing I think I told you when I actually got to see you, which was awesome to see you and every, like I said, it's a reunion and in lots of ways, especially this year, um, given everything that's been happening, was you went from what you were doing the way I knew you a couple of years ago to a whole new level of what you're doing now. I mean, you were like, you know, uh, the, the negotiator between variations of entities. I mean, and I guess, again, going back to anybody that has been to conferences, HSMA in particular, to push the money up, which is not a cheap thing, uh, to sponsor things, to try to rise yourself above the commonality of everybody's attendance, okay, is is quite a feat of recognition. I mean, just in its own merit that you were going in and saying, no, we're actually going to throw an event that have people come to it. And, you know, that was like... Where'd Steph come from? I mean, just, <laughs> it was really cool. And then, of course, watching the interactions of people, because it is, I wouldn't say it's incestuous because that's the negative connotation, but we know everybody. Everybody knows each other. And, and you know, even when the roles change, where people are doing what and how, and to see people flock to you like, Steph, it's like, she's been doing a lot of work in these past two years. <laughs> the pandemic gave us a lot of time to reflect in it. <laughs> It did indeed. Uh, yes, in that sense, it did. Yeah, the um, we had the same we had the same party last year, but it was obviously still middle of the pandemic, and it was in Dallas, um, so not quite the turnout. But now it seems now the hopefully we get to have that slot every year. So Hopper and I have already talked about having the same party next year. So I, I felt obligated to Hopper because, and I even mentioned to people there that I didn't know who I was, which. It's okay because there's new people that come up all the time. Um, that I've been, I felt like I, I wanted to say thank you because I've been ripping data from them for years. Uh, and it's like I appreciate the data you've been sharing because you know when they do their 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 functionalities of their their heat maps of calendars and so forth behind it in the scripting code is the data that pushes it so you can extract it and use it for trend analysis. And I felt kind of obligated to thank them for that because it helped with some marketing strategy. <laughs> Well, I mean, you're gonna have to teach me that. Teach me that magic. Um, no, they're good. They're good guys over there. And, yeah. No, it is true in that sense. But you've also bridged something, and I don't know whether it got accelerated. Which I should ask you whether you feel it got accelerated during the pandemic. We were struggling with people understanding that, even just using words like convergence and stuff, revenue management's interaction with marketing, as you said, marketing not being in that decision tree, just in some ways. And it seems like it, it got accelerated in just blending whether. It was forced because they had to let one or two due to go. lack of people, right? Yeah, you know, it's like okay, you're it. You got to do all this stuff, and probably that created the combinations that we're now experiencing. But it seems that you, for what you do, because when we first talk about doing this conversation about revenue management, you're very clear. It's like, look, revenue management is great, but it's only a piece of the conversation. It's not really the entity in its entirety as to the strategy that hotels need to face. So. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how you were able to combine more of what you do for clients to understand that it's just not a revenue strategy issue and it's just not a marketing report issue. It's a how do you make the two work together issue? How did you? Well, I mean, I think it's a work in progress and it depends on the person. And um, somebody in the peanut gallery, uh, Connor Vanderholm and I with Top Line Revenue, we actually did a we did a recording on this, uh, both of us at the same time with Revenue Hub um, about how can, and I feel like a lot of people, and you know, you've been to Rock, Lauren, for years, Rock's been talking about break the silos, but it's been so 30,000 foot that you're like, okay, how do you actually make it work? And, you know, and I think the start is communication, open-mindedness, and aligned KPIs. So you spoke about those before, you know, talking about top line revenue and, you know, how do you get there and how do you basically do it? You're, you're probably doing a gap analysis and say, here's where you are. Here's where you need to be. How are we going to get there? So some way, somehow we got to figure it out as a team. Um, and same thing I said at HSMAI on the presentation, like there's no, I think people think there's like some magic silver bullet they're missing when it comes to all things, you know, they're like, Oh, if I do this one thing, then maybe I'm going to make budget or something. And I'm like, yeah. no, it's a combination of like, probably 20 different things. You can probably do a hundred, but you only have the budget and time and resources to do 10 of them. Right. Yep. Yep. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of all those things. I think Lori Keel, she just did a something on, if you follow her on LinkedIn, she's been doing these kind of series and she's talking about like people and their egos. And some people are like, no, this is my space. You can't take it away from me. Yes. And that's where that open mind me, open mindedness piece comes in. Because you have to be able to be like, hey, here's what, let's come to the table and be like, here's my strength. And then also be realistic about your weaknesses and be like, okay, and here, but here's, there's some places where you can combine and interact. I think your idea will be way more successful than my current strategy. And I think it mine's maybe age influenced where I'm like, no, I'm just going to threaten revenue management to realize that marketing can replace their functionality with all the data we have. So you might want to join the team. I think your strategy is way more warm and fuzzy than the world domination concept of crushing revenue management into submission. I think, I think you got a better path than I do, at least a longer one. That is the first time anyone's ever called me warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Well, compared to what I'm suggesting, I guess you are a, a, a group hugger all of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, well, I'm going to make sure I have that on recording. That doesn't ever, that never <laughs> well, now, I know that I've always looked at you from lots of authority reasons, but one of the biggest ones is, of course, your brand authority in, in the sense of all the what you work with for the brands and, and the ways of, of using and utilizing them to full capacities for a lot of clients. I also have brand clients. And in all honesty, you know, a lot of what I do with them is very probably similar to some of the things. I mean, I, you know, talking back about Connor, I mean, I get the privilege of working with him and his team uh, with a client that is brand related. And making those combinations work is uh, a little bit of a different finesse because from a marketing perspective, I have less tools. I have less things than I can actually do from an outside brand cooperation. But you've really made a bigger bridge with that. You've created more combinations of things to do. How how is that? How did you be able to succeed in that? Because that's a delicate space to balance. I think it's ever evolving, right? There's, you know, you know, things that are so simple in the independent space, dropping your dropping a pixel and dropping a any type of conversion. You know, th those things are just out the window. So it ha you have to be strategic. And um, I always believe in maximizing the brand's tools first. There's some brands have better tools than others, and I think they're always kind of evolving. And I think it's you know, partnering with management companies that can continue to challenge some of the brands to, to do better, to be, you know, I believe in the state of constant evolution, like just be better than you were yesterday. So I think that mentality has to carry through in everything that you do. Um, I'm, I still get frustrated. I still get massively frustrated. Just, you know, I don't have all the analytics I would like. I certainly don't have all access to data at my fingertips the way I would like. Um, but trying to work on solving some of that, uh, in my quest for world domination, but that's another question I have in the, uh, the, the pen of things to ask about because you've developed some stuff, uh, and I've been dying to know more about it. And, and you even tease me, as, Hey, Lauren, we should get together. I should show you what it is. And I'm like, yeah. And then we just never have. So I'm just calling you out now. I was like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, if, because the majority of our clients and even my past life, I was working in a management company, multiple franchise, franchising, multiple brands. Um, and it's just really hard to, you know, when you're in marketing, you have a lot of data, but a lot of people, you know, are also paralyzed because they spend so much time aggregating the data versus actually action planning against it and putting up a, a plan together. So I've been basically to port, you know, developing a dashboard that, that can help management companies make their data usable. So incorporating data from their brand website data, but also Cody, Expedia travel ads, um, you know, Google My Business, social media, Google ads, display, um, basically putting in all the different places so they can be like, you know, foundationally what's working, what's not working. Um, and I think my goal in the future is basically, I mean, we're solving this problem of just being able to provide basic ownership reports, but trying to evolve it, like giving owners a scorecard that's understandable so they can mm -hmm. see the value that marketers are doing every day. Cause a lot of it, they're like, it's so ambiguous still to them, unfortunately. Um, how do we make it understandable and usable? And then, you know, so, you know, working with a brand, you can get some data points, but you pull an Excel spreadsheet and it has a one month's data points. Maybe it has year to date, maybe it has, you know, but, what if you're trying to determine trends? You're trying to see, you know, overlap year over year trends. Maybe you want to see, you know, month over month trends. Um, but basically making it so that you can use that data at your fingertips versus spending all this time. I mean, we have some management companies spending a week out of a month just doing owner reports. 
Yes. Um, I guess probably some questions that I have, and then I have a couple that we, we, we solicited with our new little link for people to say, asking so, um, so the idea of um, what you do and the reporting that you do, do you find that you are constantly in a re re-education loop, like a 51st dates movie with uh, your clients when it comes to explaining the metrics and the information? Uh, Cause I've, I've, I've from our perspective, I personally struggled through the, I have a great whizzy bang thing. And then the next month is like, explain to me what that thing. And you're sitting there going, okay, well, we're just going to blow this call to go back to the original. Call. I, I just, I mean, do you find yourself? Yeah. And then every time you have a new, you know, new contact or new GM oh. or whatever, and you know, it's, um, but in full transparency, this product is designed for above property users. It's not designed for, a GM, yes, it can provide a report to a GM or a DOS, but it's more provide, if you've got 10, 20, 100 hotels that you're trying to look at data streams for, it basically has a roll-up version and then like an, a property belt. So if you have 50 hotels and you say, okay, based on my KPIs, these three are the ones I need to dive deep on. And then you can look at a hotel individual data points and drill down deeper from there. But, um, and this is a selfish investment because this is, has been my life both now and before. So, you know, I feel like I can't be the only one with the problem. No, no, you're actually rep reflecting everybody's problem because it is true. And you bring up a really strong point between the discussion levels that you have with property engagement versus those that are uh, in corporate or management capacity above the property, multi-unit engagement, their prioritization is completely different. And unfortunately, as you said, their sandboxes are different as to what they think is theirs versus what is not theirs. Um, and I find a lot of times that the information that management is looking for is more of the insightful management uh, of just knowing the awareness of things and whether they have a contributing factor to them so that when they do talk with their properties and spur them on or granular get down to details that are between them and, and the property, that they seem a little bit more knowledgeable about things that the property may not be as, as fluent on. I don't know. And the reverse is true of properties. They want to do more that's about their bottom line on the property kind of thing. So. Yeah. And I'm still, I've still struggled with, um, you know, like my goal would be at some point to have this scorecard that basically, you know, in, interprets the entire customer journey, but that's impossible to do really. Cause you, there's so many things that you're just never going to get data on no matter branded or unbranded there's just going to be so many things you're not there's going to be broken pieces right how do you like fill in those gaps to like understand the impact of the total customer journey um and i've i've run across problems where i feel like the data i hand over is as basic and as black and white and bright as day and you can it's captain obvious info and then i get a completely weird question or completely weird you're interpretation. Like, i missed the mark like, you're like <laughs> How did you get that from that? I don't understand. <laughs> did you turn it upside down? Was it like that commercial in the, in the Super Bowl? And, and I mean, you really just are, are wondering how they saw it. And then strangely enough, and, I'm, and not to be negative about the conversation, sometimes they come back with an incredible question going, holy, didn't even think about that one. Wow. Yeah, that does do this to that. Or So it's, it's a balancing act. I mean, sometimes it gets read wrong. Sometimes it gets read in a way that you didn't anticipate. But the fact that you have that kind of information is crucial because we do the same kind of things in ways with like data studios and so forth. And there's gaps where you just have to do implied metric that gives a percentage value relationship to show some measurability as to what the campaigns are doing. Yeah. And I love Google, Google data studio for our independent hotels. We, I mean, it's a, it's a great tool, right? But it still doesn't incorporate your entire online presence in terms of, it's all, it's still related to your own website, right? It's still based on everything that comes in through your website. But there's so much that's outside of that that's happening here. Like I'm not saying, I mean, obviously book the rec website, you know, numero uno, but there's still this other ecosphere that we have to incorporate into our, into our analysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, Connor uh, asked when it's going to be available. We have, some, we have clients in beta right now. Um, so anybody that wants to, demo it, test it out. We can get you loaded. I think that, you know, me being the, you know, I want it to be here, but, you know, in terms of the development pipeline, I think any SaaS product, any BI tool is in a constant state of evolution. It's not like, okay, you know, I've built it. It's a hundred percent. Like 
I want it. I have so many things that I want it to be. Um, I don't know if, I mean, it's never going to be done per se, right? It's a, mm. the, well, I mean, it kind of goes back to the old adage about Apple with their phone. It was being belittled when it first came out and then they put the app store out and the community, the consumers are really what defined the value proposition of it because they were able to interact with it where they thought of ways of using it that were never thought of by the designers. The designers were containing it to their pre preconceived notions. They built and that's why we want the product. beta testers because they're going to be the ones that are, you know, given the feedback. So I, I tell everybody like, if you, you know, if you're going to be one of the betas, you have to give me feedback like that. This isn't just a, like, until I start hearing like multiple requests, oh, this is a random KPI that my owner wants. Like once I start hearing it two, three, four times, then I'm like, okay, maybe this might be something that's valuable to the community as a whole versus mm -hmm. like, you know, um, but I find a lot of people are reporting out on the same, pretty much the same data points. Um, or even, uh, but again, mostly back, mostly return on ad spend focused. So, you know. Do you, do you feel, because you have communications and liaisons with the, the brands that I don't have, you've worked your way into conversations that have been very instrumental in, I think, honestly, influencing some of the brand's perspectives as to how they've been handling. Whether well, you full know transparency, we don't have any master services agreement with the, any of the hotel brands. So I'm saying right. on record. Um, right. That, it's, it's 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 an it's an entirely it's 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 a cooperative of, of respect for and, and you'd say that of any company really they will talk to people that they feel are fluent in the dialogue that it's not just them responding to a begrudged person like saying i didn't like this or i think this is a problem they're active open dialogues with with people that they see within the industry i mean that's one thing i will always give credit to all the brands is that they will actually talk to people they feel understand the perspective of whatever the discussion topic is and, and they do, a, a, I think, a decent job of that. Now, not whether they implement stuff is another story, but whether they listen is there. And I think that you, you've gotten their attention in lots of ways because you can validate perspective clearly and succinctly, which actually goes to one of the questions I want to make sure I ask. Um, so out of all of this, do you see, like, for instance, the whole transition of analytics that are happening, it's forcing all the brand's hands to a new level of dynamics as to their reporting processes eventually. Um, they're going to have to take the gerbil out of the bottom of the Bethesda eventually and <laughs> use it in a different wheel somewhere. But the metrics associated with some of those things, given that there is more dynamic content metrics available eventually, do you feel that the brands will begin to distribute that data in a meaningful way for at least management groups, ownership clusters, or anything that is of that level at least? Or do you feel that they're always going to keep the rein on the way they've done it. If any of the brands want to talk to me about letting me support their platforms, I'm happy. To <laughs> I just, I, you know, I mean, I'm needing. I mean, I get it. I think that I think they're really they they they're divided in terms of who their clients are. Yeah. Uh, if you there's the big management companies, there's the media management companies, and then there's the smaller owners that have one two hotels and GMs or whatnot, right? So. I think there's, I don't know, I don't, I don't actually know the ratio of, I would say that the smaller, let's say management companies, 10 and under hotels probably hold a lot more weight than you might think. So they're, they have this balancing act in terms of how to deliver the data mm -hmm. and how great, you know, and the massive amounts of data that they have, how do they distribute it in a way that's, because I mean, how many reports the, you know, there's, you know, IHG has been deprecating a lot of their reports because people just weren't using it. They built all these crafty reports that mm -hmm. they were like, we, we look at it. We can tell that nobody's downloading these yeah. reports. And yeah. that's, but I would say that's the same for all of our, the marketing data that we're pulling. It's, it's not that people don't know it's there. It's just like, I don't have the time to do this for 20, 50 hotels every single month. And then somehow create this pivot table that incorporates into a roll-up report that I can do something with it. Yep. And I think, and, and, and this is in reference to Connor because we've had these discussions for our, our, our client relationship where we have, is there's a commonality of usable data versus non-usable data that it's great that you can calculate the pen, trend and pace associated with a particular thing as a curiosity answer, but the functionality of a value of it being a perpetual report and or whether it's actually useful outside of what you asked it for, it gets very, very, and, and they do have to deal with, I think Tim Peter from way back when we were all together on the show, pointed out the fact that when he was with a very large company, 
that even if it 5% of the owners disagreed or were troublesome, that represented thousands of people. And that metric sounded really large, but you consider the tens of thousands of people that were following the lines of progress and doing the things they were supposed to do. So you look at these large brands that are massive in scale in comparison to that example. And it's like, they have to go for the common factors a lot of times because as much as there might be a squeaky wheel, you know, there's always going to be the majority of people that are like, they don't use the stuff. They don't, it's not a value proposition. We, we threw it out there because somebody asked us about it and nobody used it. So it's true. Gonna, yeah. It's true. Even from my days of working at a, you know, fairly large management company, over a hundred hotels, um, as a squeaky wheel, which I could be, I'd certainly had more weight depending on how many hotels we had. And that's just the, the nature of the beast, right? If you, you know, you can get a little bit more customization. I think that's just, it is what it is, right? There is a, um, I don't know her age. I'll just say young woman because I have no effort and I can't say her name correctly. Uh, she sent this from Japan. Okay. She apparently saw you speak. <laughs> she refers to Steph, great stuff. You uh, solicited um, our engagement with with brand. Sorry, I'm reading it to make sure I'm saying it right. Uh, with brand, but we don't know what to ask. How mm -hmm. do we ask the right question to get what we want from the brand that doesn't listen? Uh, <laughs> sorry, that doesn't listen is in the question, okay? <laughs> I mean, is there is there right questions? Is there is there questions that can claw into something worth that they're going to reply just because they have to? Is there ways of asking questions? Well, one, I mean, I think it's a convoluted system because sometimes it's not only what do you ask, but it's who do you ask? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the hardest part is finding a who um, in some of some of the brands. And then, I mean, unfortunately, depending on your brand, some of the brands just don't have the resources. And so you just got to go rogue. I mean, ask for ask for forgiveness instead of permission. But uh, my motto for them, um, yeah, I'm because I think that I think there's some. I think that you know, are you asking? Are you needing something from, from the brand because you you know have an underperforming asset and you don't feel like the brand's pulling their weight? Is that you know the type of conversation you have? But if you want to have any you know, do you have a franchise rep? You got to start with that person who's usually an ops person. And then you got to somehow use that person. And that's what I've kind of found. If you don't have, if you're not a large enough hotel or company where you've got a person, you got to work through your franchise rep. And even the smaller brands will have a franchise rep, even the smallest of brands. So you got to start there. Um, and I think some people just don't know, to, back to the, you don't know what questions to ask. I think that's true all the time. I mean, even when I, when we, you know, onboarding a new hotel and I'm asking the team, like we have to figure out these, these information, but sometimes people process questions differently. They don't understand. So sometimes it's like, wait a minute, why are you asking me this question? What is it the end goal that you're trying right. to achieve? Mm -hmm. And then work backwards from there. Does that make sense? It does. Cause I think, uh, I, my, my, I did a quick little thank you for it. Her name is me. Nope. Not gonna do it. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Cause I'll probably really, yeah, bad. I'm um, sorry in advance for Lauren. He botches everyone's names. So. They, everyone's names. It Bob, I have problems with. So it's okay. It's it's it, it's part of my nature for it. What I did say was um, building a rapport with building a relationship with whoever it is that you have communication capabilities with is probably your first step. So that just like you said, when you ask a question, there's a predication of an interpretation as to how you're asking or why you're asking it because you have something that's been already discussed or an issue for it. But I also gave the other comment of being as educated as you possibly can, because the first dumb question is the first step away. You know, as soon as you ask the first dumb question, like, so, so what is are you saying, Lauren, that there is such thing as a dumb question? Oh, hell, I ask them all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because it, I would say, you know, dumb is probably a, a, a blunting of the blade for it, because um, if you're asking a question about something that you could answer yourself and or you're asking in a way that isn't understood what you're asking about, that's a question that is kind of a, really? I'm, I don't have time to waste explaining something you can explain to yourself. I'm not going to really be bothered with this. But if you ask an intelligent question that says, I did all the things that the system has given to me and I can't get the answer that I want. Is that's there very a true. show your due diligence? Show that you Google yeah. something, you looked on the internet, you you know, 
Um, yeah. I'm going to tell Connor, yes, Google that shit is right. <laughs> and is I funny. mean, in my prior life, I used to use that acronym a lot because I oversaw IT. So people would ask me a lot of really, really. Um, Incredible questions. Yes. And, and to this day, because I'm supposedly the tech person in my family. My wife will smoke me on search any day of the week. I don't know why or how she's able to ask a better question than me, but she does. Like, I'll go look at them. I was like, nope, I have no idea what that is. And she says, what? I just found it. And I'm like, what did you ask? I mean, it really is in the question asker person, you know? <laughs> it is. Um, but I find there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of resources out there within each of the brand systems that it's just, a but I mean, you can spend hours going down these rabbit holes, figuring out, where to go and who to go to and what form to use. And um, now your BI that you're working and developing and creating for purposes of solution. Do you think that that the, your intent with it, I should say is to create it as a kind of a point of truth for referencing data that isn't as easily found elsewhere, or is it for decision modeling? I mean, what did, what is, what is your aspirational perspective of this? I'm so glad you asked that, Lauren. <laughs> Try to ask good questions. My aspirational goal would be to become a star report for marketing. Very cool. So one day, if there's critical mass, whatever, X amount, whatever, however many hotels that you can basically, because a lot of times we do, we go to owners and be like, hey, here's these results. And they're like, was well, that good or bad? What? Right? And they're like, I don't, you have to tell me. I don't know. Is this? Is this a good number? Is this a bad number? Should I be looking at this number? Should we be looking at that number? Right? So how do we, and I think, you know, like the hotels network is trying to do that a little on a smaller scale with like conversion numbers. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's one metric. It's a great metric, but you can only do it for independent hotels if in the United States. The percentage of branded hotels far outweighs. This isn't, you know, this isn't Europe. Right? So if we're going to have meaningful data that actually speaks cross you know, all types of hotels, but even how can we segment the data and be like, what's a good KPI or a good return on ad spend, whatever for this type of hotel or in this type of market or this brand? I think that I'm probably going to, you know, I think there's a lot of people that don't like cross brand type analysis to be done. So I think that that aspirational piece might be a challenge, but that's still where I'd like to go. I that yeah, I, I, I to, to me, it's it's for any management or ownership group that has multi brand, whether you admit it or not, you're doing cross brand analysis because of the ownership space on what you're seeing, especially if they're in similar market or same market. What you know. people do with their data is up to them. It's up to them, and yes, and 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 all of to that point again because it's, we're not uh, owing to anyone here. Smith Travel Research, Star Reports, have been incredibly valuable in times when there wasn't as much diverse data. I think now they have a diminished value of data, and yet they're held at a high level artificially. Because as we all know, Star Reports are often motivated by a variety of values, financial, operational, marketing. Everybody has a hand in the delegation and in, in, uh, identification that is used for these things for different purposes. That being said, I don't discount the value of the information. I just, I'm, I'm questioning the austerity that it's placed at. Like it is like the, the end all be all. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. You know, our rev part, tab four, man, that's it. Boom. <laughs> I'm what you got. Um, you know, and you and you go into the meeting knowing you're going to get the crap beat out of here. You're walking out like a hero, whatever it is. But the other is, and this goes to other alternatives of data sources like this. I believe that Calibre is a malleable tool that is often used to create statistical values and discounting other numbers that don't validate a question. I think it, it because it's not that the data is bad or anything. I'm not discounting their sourcings, but I think that they take samplings a little too far for implicated values. Uh, or I think that people use the data to solidify a position, disregarding the data that doesn't solidify the position. I think giving people sometimes too much access to data variations creates the ability to ma to manipulate it to some degree. I think. Yeah, but I mean, let's be honest. Agencies have been manipulating data for like. Oh crap! Time. Yeah, I mean, yes. Let's ignore all these numbers that don't show us looking good, and let's highlight these little numbers that make us look like rock stars. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's the flaw of it that I think. Why I'm excited about what you're doing is, to me, what you're putting together 
is a way of comparative analysis saying, great, you want to look at star reports that way? They tell you what you think it says there. You look at Calibri data and you think it says it this way there. And you can look at other sources of data branded or not. But then your tool says, let's compare value propositions based on established KPIs. Let's look at what you value in comparison to how the data reflects against it, which I think is going to be a really cool way of people using it as a leverage point. Yeah, but what I've continued to struggle with is that marketing data is usually based off book data. Almost every other, whether it's star, whether it's, you know, everyone else is pulling PMS data. So it's usually consumed data. Uh, yep. I have not bridged this gap between book versus consume, you know, like even a simple branded hotel, it's impossible to figure out what your cancellation rate is during the pandemic. We knew it was happening. Right. But how do I quantify if you really want to focus on total lifetime value of customer and return on ad spend, you got to look at your cancellation rate. And I yep. swear some of my hotels without having the data to prove it, we're canceling at a 50% rate. So 50, 60%. How do we, I have not figured out, I would love to be able to figure out how to bridge that gap between marketing data, which is usually booked versus in some of the reports you can get it's consumed, but the PMS, I'm pulling them from completely different places than most people pulling through the PMS. So that's the other thing that I think kind of, needs to be solved that I haven't figured out yet. Um, I have come up with one problem based on exactly what you're saying. And that is um, not to peek behind the curtain kind of thing, but uh, we were using it in relationship to meta search for a client that we were, we have confirmation numbers obviously for it. And, and so we were comparing that to the actualized according to the dates of arrival to determine a percentage wash of uh, cancellations so that we could calculate that into a commission relationship. Like, okay, your average cancellations 16% based on this channel, because each channel is different. I mean, so it's not like- Wouldn't it be great to be able to break it down per channel? Uh, that is dream. But yeah, uh, but the idea of at least if you could give some stick in the sand that is quasi relevant to other channels. Like this channel may only be the one you can measure, but at least you have a number to imply on the other channels. Like, okay, let's just average that against everybody. But we were doing that to identify it. The issue is, is that it's not sustainable. It's very manual because you're literally asking for an end of the day report from night audit to give me the, the, the numbers of it, what's in house to compare against the numbers that I had based on book. Yeah. But hypothetically, all that's, you could automate. Yes. That. Yes. What? Yeah. Well, you can, you could automate very many pieces of that. I'm all yes. at, but the, the point being like, how many, again, how many people are going to use that? How many people, you know, am I building it for one person? Am I building it for 50? But I totally get, um, I totally get your point. And then it also gets into a different, once I start getting down into individual guest data, then there's a different compliance level from a, that I have to, you know, adhere to obviously. Oh, but, absolutely. And then, you know, the, the only one, and it's the, the, the one that you can get the most data from is the one you, that most people are least cared about. And that's your OTA cancellations because to them because totally. you can see it's so easy in Expedia like yeah and it's yet, just like right there it's just like boom so easy I'm doing it yeah and unfortunately that's what we've been using as a basis point you're like okay is this I told it's one of them it's one of the only ones you can look at and say okay if this is happening here and I can say firsthand it is skewed depending upon market depending upon brand depending upon inventory because in New York Midtown 75 80 percent cancellation totally realistic in OTA world However, but how, if you could basically use your modeling to say, here's my brand.com cancellation, here's my OTA cancellation, you know, and then think about all, I mean, it's something as simple as that. Yeah. Well, I, I used it because we do meta search that I, I wanted to show the value proposition of, of the, the three sources of revenue, which by the way, for anybody that by meta search, a lot of, of companies that do meta search, they take credit for all the organic stuff that Google provides for you. That's a huge whopping number that had nothing to do with paid campaigns. That's just gross revenues. And they'll also throw in your commission savings because they'll go and they'll look at your OTA displacement of what you did directly and say, well, what is your commission rate? 18%, 16%? Great. We're just going to add that on top of the pile of what we saved you from it. It's a legit number. It's not saying that it doesn't have the implied channel shift value, but they make it sound like some whopping 50 to one return for what you spend when they throw in the organic from Google, the paid results, and also the commission savings. But to your point, we created a calculation Can of- we publish that? No. Oh, we use it. We, I have a fun, I can show you a really funky spreadsheet that would be really ugly, but. Well, I know somebody that would be very interested in seeing that spreadsheet. Oh um, yeah. I, I mean, we, we calculate because one thing that we made the spreadsheet for was when we're telling somebody they should do the meta search, they have no metrics to define. They don't know total volume of voice. They don't know conversion value. 
and they don't know what the value of the conversion for it. So we asked them for certain numbers. I made this calculator that comes up with, I asked for four years worth of numbers, previous to COVID-19, 2020, 2021, 22's current actual is in, and also forecast. We put that in, I get a uh, average weighted mean ADR, average weighted mean uh, length of stay, average weighted mean value of conversion, put that in, and then I take that and come up with the three variables that you miss, total volume of voice based on symbiotic paid campaigns, uh, um, implied conversion based on same paid campaigns because they they balance. We have data to show that meta search volume and cost are parallel to paid campaigns. And so we can actually say if we spend this much money, the anticipated range of revenue that they're going to generate and or conversion value that they're going to create. It's we just, know how I feel about meta search. I mean, I, I think it's... Uh... Yeah, but we, we, we all, the reason I brought it up is that the idea of it is, is that we show the value of what OTAs generate for you versus what you generate for yourself, that the cancellation percentages are five to 8%, I'd say rounded up to 10 to be generous, but 8% um, uh, lesser, that you actually get less cancellations through the direct channel conversion because people relate to their booking directly to the hotel than they do through the OTA that they just don't know whether the, very, the, the solidity of the conversion is there. So there is a variance between your cancellations for your direct channel meta search versus your OTA meta search. Just that's a lot if that's, you know, but yeah, I mean, that's the that's kind of data that I can't imagine how long that took you to pull. Well, it, we, we had to do it over a span <laughs> and we did over a span of, of a group of hotels and sad to say, and I, it has nothing to do with our brand conversation. It was all independent hotels. So we had the ability to get the type of data that we needed because yes, we could go into a brand's OTA contribution and get that from their insights and so forth. But um, we have no comparison to direct channel meta because we really can't measure that say versus the relationship that reports come from Cody on, <laughs> which is a really simplistic report. Anyways. Yeah. Where do you see the, the whole BI going? Eventually, when, when, once it starts rolling, flowing the way you want to, you see it being able to be able to be compared against the more traditional star reports and, and things like that. That says, no, I think it's a complementary piece. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. And I did. I did the. I for this product, I did the pitch competition at High Tech. So the Entrepreneur U Twenty X pitch at High Tech, um, which. First of all, I was just thrilled to get into the top seven, right? I mean, very cool. A little birdie told me there were over, you know, there were 38 semifinalists, I think. So, wow. I was just happy to get, you know, to the final stage. But, you know, I, I had some feedback from one of the judges because they asked, Do you have any competition in the space? And I mean, and I said, I said, not that I'm aware of. And they were like, you can never say that and ever. And I'm like, as far as I know, there's no technology that aggregates this data. And they're like, oh, there has to be. And I'm like, but is there? Yeah. That that sounds like a catch-22 because here, here, listening to pitches, if you say quantifiably, there is nobody that's doing what we're doing, you're creating an automatic skepticism did you fully vet that or are you just basing that on a verbose statement? So yeah. you already have a doubt. And if you're honest, like you did saying, as far as I'm aware of, it's allowing the latitude saying that somebody might have this on a dev table somewhere. We don't know. We know that it's not in market to what we're competing with. And we know that nobody else is using or has a means of using that way we were developing it and being honest. And then they're going to chide you saying that you never say this. Like, well, you want me to lie then? Sure. Nobody else has this. Brilliant. Nobody. I know this for I a mean, fact. I think there's some management companies that develop it internally for mm -hmm. their own proprietary internal sources. But I will say they won't have all, don't have all the data that I have, or at least in this quantifiable capacity. I will say that there are a lot of digital marketing agencies that support hotels that have their own dashboards, but they're only, they're not the, they're not bringing in all the brand data because they are pulling it from Google Analytics, Omniture into their own dashboard. They pull it from GMB. They pull it from even, you know, the OTA insights of the world. They quote, have some marketing stuff, but again, it's not, they're not aggregating the data points from, you know, so we pull in channel mix, top referring domains, uh, source traffic, and, and then just overall visits and revenue for all the major brands. Sweet. So that in itself is kind of where, I mean, anyway, I can pull in Google ads API. Anybody can pull in social media APIs. Yes, we do that, but anybody can do that, right? right. 
Um, that's not, you know, but even the Expedia and Cody data that we pull, unfortunately, is not API driven. So everyone's like, I'm like, if it, if it has an API, I'm sure somebody already has it easily. The hard part has been developing things that don't have an API. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have to scrape it and automate it. And then, yeah, I use a tool that does. Yeah. But I'm sure you have the same kind of thing. You have to then extract the data to be used. And it's not always in the, con the ways of creating the conditional relationship that you're looking at for the math. It's, it sometimes doesn't match what you're trying to get from it kind of thing. But speaking of one thing, just because we're getting close to the hour thing is, um, so high tech versus option B in the future? Who knows? I mean, we, we did want to season the pot up with the news thing because it is, it's a popcorn moment to sit and watch the people. Beat each other up. I, um, I am following that. And I, I, I enjoy high tech as a conference. I appreciate, you know, getting into, I know some people on the board. I know, you know, I appreciated being able to have a booth there and yeah, I've done two booths this year and let's just say my high tech booth did way better than my other yeah. booth. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, with that, and it's just, you know, like the vendors that are there are super high caliber, I think. Um, but to watch them, vocally come out against AHNLA. And I mean, you, anyway, I can read between the lines, go watch, um, Rich Siegel's. Did you watch if, did you watch Rich Siegel and Frank Wolf's um, podcast? That came yes, out I did. yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> it, it's amazing. I mean, again, we, before we started talking on the show today, we just kind of touched it for a second. You know, I can see both sides of the dialogue. And I can see, you know, from a, from a, just a sheer competitive point of view, if you're going to come in, you're going to go into the biggest obstacle first. Uh, you're not trying to create some sort of parallel universe. To, but the venomacy of the dialogue, the venomacy of the effort, the absolute disdain. And I guess maybe it was solicited because they just, hey, we'd like to buy you guys. You should be like we're asking you. What? You know, I think that kind of went really on the wrong direction as to how the conversation went after that. And then you throw into the fact that... Uh, talking about Marriott and, and uh, Ahoa, it's, just, it's kind of this, why have everybody all of a sudden deciding that they're going to draw lines in the sand about conversations? You know, uh, if I find it kind of telling, switching over to the Marriott thing just real quick, very telling that um, they don't want any sort of negative implication to the management of their business from an entity that they support the freedom to discuss the industry with. I find it kind of a, and especially with that, entity being such a strong representation of the people that own the franchise very high, relationship. Very high percentage of, yeah. um, you know, I don't know, owning, you know how, I mean, owning a business is very personal. Your brand is very personal. I, you know, like I've, you know, had people, you know, offer to buy me out or oh, buy out yeah. my platform, you know, that type thing. And I, it always, I don't know how you don't take it personally. How do you, I don't, it's impossible for me to do it because it's too ingrained in my heart and my soul to, yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. you remember when you were sitting around when you first came up with the name, you remember the first time you put the website, you first one we put the first piece of business, first contract. There is a intimate All engagement. Day. Yes. You know, and for that to be like a check that's signed to you and then somebody else has that, 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 uniqueness that you created yeah. and then and the you, whole like you know underdog slash you know yep big elephant i mean there's a lot of dynamics at play so i you know i don't envy the people that are putting out the pr i would not want to be their pr agency in those communications and letters that have been released mm -hmm. um but you got to figure because all the things we're saying about individual ownership i mean i have the benefit of being of an age now where i purposely do what I do, not for the intent of selling it off as a company. When I finish and stop having fun doing this stuff, it just goes away. I have no interest in selling off what HDM is. The idea of a family and without how Ho and a lot of the owners building and up and having it as a family business in a very cultural perspective way, that is even more ingrained into the, the fabric of what their business is. And now they're being faced to like mom versus dad. Like I'm a part of this organization that represents a entity of relationship that I have. And now I have the place I've invested money into that puts their name above the building I bought, not playing nice with each other. Like, 
okay, so who am I supposed to be? It's like, I kind of go back to when I used to run the hotel where when brands showed up, we had the little brand flag up front. You know, we were all brand people. And as soon as they left, the management company came in, we put the brand flag on. I'm like, yeah, we're all management team. You know, it's like whatever invading army came in, where are your boys? (laughs) It's so true. And so the other drama that I like to, that I'm also watching popcorn about, um, the Castell Project, who actually got bought by or consumed by AHLA last year, mm-hmm. they just put out their updated thing that shows basically how much women and black representation are on the different boards. And they specifically say there are two companies that of the 30 that they survey that do not have any rep- women representation at all on their board. And if you follow her tellier and a couple others, there's somebody's going to find out who those two are. So whoever you are, you better get ready to get exposed. So everybody already kind of, anyway, yeah, there's, there's, (laughs) there's a pretty clear picture without having to, you just have to look at the listings of positions and realize, "Hmm." you think you know who it is? Uh, I I got it. I got a really sneaky suspicion of one of them. Okay. I'll send you a note because there's a couple of us that are uh, curious. I, I, I just because with any of the research stuff that you do and the who, you know, because all of a sudden you get them too. You get somebody out of the blue that calls and refers to you like they know you from when you were a kid. And you're like, I have no idea who you are. And I know I'm bad with names, but I'm not that bad with like saying I never talked to somebody. Uh, and they're trying to be all friendly to you and you go to look them up and then you look at their infrastructure. You look at it and you're like, OK, sure. You know, you get these real. And then that's where a lot of that comes from is because like, you get um, with some of the stuff there's ways that people reach out to you. Like just because of the show, sometimes people will like, will be like, Oh yeah, I want to talk. And they feel like they know you because they see you and they're talking to you. Like, I have no idea why we're talking. <laughs> well, trust me. How many, can I tell you how many times that happened at HS May I at our happy oh. hour? I was like, yeah, well you were the bell of the ball too. I mean, honestly, you're throwing your own party. You invited everybody in. You're throwing some, Oh, what? Hey, look, 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 look. Swag. <laughs> <laughs> I literally have it on my desk. It has fulfilled its mission. Okay. I need to give you nicer swag. That's not good swag. Oh, it's spongy swag that keeps the coffee cup on it. It's it's a good spongy swag. Um, but yeah, that was I was stoked. And honestly, it, this is just from a personal perspective. I feel like I've known you long enough that I revel in your successes vicariously. <laughs> I'm like, you go and kick your ass, man. Because I I it just was fun to see you in a different way at the conferences. It wasn't just a generalized participation, fellow attendee, good to know each other. You know, we respected each other and, and others that we know for doing what they do. You know, uh, you were highlighted. You, I mean, other than the presentations you did at Asia's May I, what you did at High Tech, what you were doing in terms of sponsorships and showcasing yourself, and then talking about new products to market. I don't, I, I would, I would never have the cojones to put a product to market. I'll talk all day long about crappy ass spreadsheets and things that functionally work so I can show numbers. But to think that I got to put lipstick on it, put it onto a platform, distribute it and try to say, Ooh, Oh, that's, well, that's serious. Watch work. what you say. Cause I could, I could go down in a heap of flames in the next six months. There's, I mean, wow. entrepreneurship is two, one step forward, two steps back every day, I think still. And I'm four years, I'm only four years in. I feel like every day I'm still getting kicked in the gut. So. It, it, but I think you've risen a lot. Of, to me personally, what I felt what happened at the conferences is that the authenticity that people saw you in and the way that people were engaging with you, whether they were new or just people that you knew from times before, they treated you differently or at least looked at you differently as to the authority that you had. Man. Uh, your, your Pikachu stuff, I'm well, Pikachu, the, 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 the lightning round was solid. It was, it was the starting one. It was the kick. It, it created the whole dynamic going afterwards from it. That was like the benchmark for the conversations that followed. Other people did good work with it. Don't get me wrong, but you set the pace to it because as I said before, it went from, is this going to get screwed up? Is this a train wreck in slow motion we're watching? Or is it a true, wow, the point was made well. And we didn't, we stopped caring about whether the slides was in sequence and whether the context was, was correct, it was more about the content took over the presentation, which is, I think, why those presentations are so uh, incredibly polar. Like it's a they're either phenomenal or they're strange. <laughs> yeah, because it is one of those things where you can't. And you're right. No matter how much I can talk to to, to a wall, you're right. But tell me, I have to pace it. And I told you, I cheated on mine. Right? I think I told you this. 
I don't know. You should have told me before that. Okay. Well, so <laughs> I had the, I was one of the ones that originally worked with, we, we decided to put the, the, the lightning rounds, we didn't call them lightning rounds, the or whatever it was at the time was called it. And so uh, when I gave my submission of my slides, I know that each of my slides didn't have the same value in the sense that this slide had a lot more data that I needed to talk about. The next slide had a lot less data to talk about. So what I did was I, I knew I had the time limit, but I changed the pace duration of each slide playing. So that with slide may have been 17 seconds. This one might've been five seconds. But what I did do is I put a faint line on the bottom that was a progress bar that I know to look for, but nobody else saw it on the bottom of the screen. So as I'm talking, I could actually see when I was gonna have the slide change. So I knew to shut up <laughs> or finish what I was gonna say faster. So I kind of cheated because I changed the, the slide durations and I put a little progression indicator for me to keep track of it. So- uh, Well, I encourage anybody to do it. I mean, it challenged oh, me. Yeah. And thank, shout out to Kelly McGuire for coaching me through it. Um, you know, it's certainly, challenge me in ways that I haven't been challenged before. That's somebody else that's really come into her own. Is Kelly. She is. Yeah. And I if mean, you, she did her lightning round last, last year in Dallas, or was that Minneapolis? She, she's, she nails it. Oh uh, yeah. He's, yeah. he's fantastic to talk to and the stuff that she's working on is awesome. Yeah. She, she has done phenomenal. Oop. We're running over our hour, but for all good reasons and stuff. Well, uh, and Connor, thank you. You're, you're, you're guys, it's not that bad time. Okay. So, um, Steph, always a pleasure. You know, always would love to have you whenever you have the chance to do this. I do need to have a sidebar with you and actually see the BI to just get all oud and goggly all over it anyway. No, I mean, you can rip, and I want you to rip it rip it apart because I think, you know, I, I've been looking at it for so long that I it's hard for me to, like, extract my own thoughts. I'll be happy to be, yes. I got to be careful because another friend of mine went over and asked me to review their conference and I sent them kind of a blunt reply. You told me. Yeah. And I feel bad. And I got some emails this week and it made me think of you. <laughs> I guess I got to get off the candor old man thing. Like, oh yeah, I can just tell them what I think. It's like, sometimes you just got to soften it up a little bit. You know what? That's the beauty of being who we are, Lauren. We I always say, I used to tell my old boss that I don't have a boss anymore for other than my husband, but it's, you know, I just feel better saying it, giving my two cents. I don't care if you don't do anything with it. I don't care. You know, you can take it or leave it. You can not like it, like it, whatever. I don't care, but I feel a lot better. Yeah. Just I'll tell you the truth. Cents. Yeah. I, Brutal you know, honesty. It's a blessing and a curse. It, it is. And that's a candor is a thing. So, um, oh, okay. So before we go, people don't know where to find you, where to look for uh, Cogwell Marketing and everything. Where do they find you? Yeah, you can find uh, me primarily on LinkedIn, Stephanie Sparks Smith. Um, you can find Cogwell Marketing at cogwellmarketing.com. Uh, you can also find our BI tool, Cogwell Analytics, um, also at cogwellmarketing.com. Uh, I got an easy, uh, you can book some book a 30-minute slot right there on the homepage if you want to talk to me. And um, we also have our own LinkedIn um, for Cogwell as well. So we share tips and tricks that are, you know, not as personal as the stuff that I do. And then I'm also a partner at Cayuga Hospitality Consultants. So if you need something other than digital marketing, I can find you in the resources for that as well. So. And I would highly recommend people, especially branded hotels in particular, because it is a rare find, slightly unicornish, to say that you have somebody that is so well-versed in multiple brands and the, not just the superficial, oh yeah, they'd only do this and they'll do this, which is a lot of people that are out there that think they know what's going on because they worked at a property or something. You're actually the person that says, no, nope, we actually know how to use these things to your benefit. So yes, you've always been my go-to resource when it comes to brand. Like I have no idea what those people are doing. What, is this, what does Steph know? <laughs> um, and Clear they, value proposition. So, yeah. Well, and I'm so glad you got me to get on, even though, oh, and my last thing is I just moved to Boston. You may or may not be able to see the boxes. So if anybody is in the Boston um, Metroplex, preferably South Shore, I'd love to get together. I think there's an event coming up uh, in the next month or so. So excited to get into the city. So hit me up, fellow mass people. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with you in a few short months and see if any of the dialect has infused itself into your conversations. Just you know, little mannerisms, little colloquialisms. I'm just looking forward to that. Mm, I've know. left. I left Virginia 20 years ago, and they have not subsided whatsoever. Nope. So I'm pretty there. sure that um, this is what you're gonna. This is what you're stuck with. 
Well, I don't know because Stuart came over all British like, and now he's British Carolina combo. It's all muddled stuff like Miss Doubtfire. It's like it's muddled. <laughs> <laughs> Good times oh. as always, Lauren. I'm so glad you had me on today. Oh, I'm thankful that you were able to make it and looking forward to finding out more information, cool stuff. And Connor, thanks for catching us on the side. Um, we'll see everyone. Uh, for everyone who's watching us on the channel, so we're recasting. We're actually reca we're casting on Cogwheel Marketing's Facebook page. You know, we always do that. So it's there. So you'll be able to see replays of this afterwards as well. So thank you so much, Steph. And thank you, everybody, thanks, for everybody. being with us today. We'll catch everyone next week. Show 366. Bye.